Welcome to the Real Love Ready Virtual Summit, our second virtual summit. We're so excited to have everyone here for tonight's presentation with Terry Real. Please join the chat. There's a chat box in the bottom of the Zoom meeting screen. Please let us know your name and where you're from. We're just gonna take maybe two minutes to allow everybody to join the Zoom meeting. And I would just love to, um, for you to introduce yourself, please. So happy to have you. Um, you're talking to our participants now or me? Yes. Okay. Oh, hi, Katrina. <laughs> Can everybody, can everybody see both Terry and myself? Hi, Katrina, nice to see you. Thank you for, um, nice to see you again. I know you were in part of our first summit. Terry from St. Louis, so nice to have you. Hi, Victoria, a fellow Canadian. We, we got your question, so we're hoping that Terry will have time to answer your question tonight. Mike from Indiana, nice to see you. Monica from Toronto. Hi, Monica. Oh, Katrina is also Canadian. Fantastic. We have people from all over the globe in this summit, which, and that is one of the most beautiful things about having um, a virtual experience is being able to share this with everybody in the world. So, and we have Terry Real, Terry Real. <laughs> Hi, Anne-Marie. Well, I think we're gonna get started. I'm a very timely person and we're, um, we, we only have a limited time with Terry. So I'm gonna introduce him. And um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Robin Ducharme. I'm the founder of Real Love Ready. And we have partnered with the most amazing company called High Tide, who have um, set this up for us virtually on their app and made it just su super easy and convenient. And also I just love this tool because we're able to all join on our phones where we all are most like a lot of time in the day and really do it together, learn about um, being better in relationships. So it's a great platform. Thank you for organizing this high tide. So welcome to our second Real Love Ready virtual summit. And the theme of this exciting four weeks is all about relational communication. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge how grateful I am to be living and working and playing on the traditional territories of the Wasanich and Lekwanen speaking peoples, the original caretakers of this land that we call home in Victoria. Tonight, I am honored and so excited to introduce Terry Real. Terry is a nationally recognized family therapist, author, and teacher. He is particularly known for his groundbreaking work on men and male psychology, as well as his work on gender and couples. He has been in private practice for over 30 years. Terry's appeared often as a relationship expert on Good Morning America and ABC News. His work has been featured in numerous academic articles, as well as media venues such as Oprah, 2020, The Today Show, CNN, and many others. In 97, he published the national bestseller, I Don't Want to Talk About It, the first book ever written on the topic of male depression. That was followed by How Can I Get Through to You? An exploration of the role of patriarchy in relationships. And most recently, The New Rules of Marriage, What You Need to Know to Make Love Work, a practical guide for couples and couples therapists. Terry founded the Relational Life Institute in Massachusetts. Terry was dissatisfied with how therapy was done. So he created his own school of therapy called Relational Life Therapy. He says, today marriage is in pretty rough shape. Well, 43 to 48% divorce rate. And at the same time, we've never wanted more from our long-term relationships. We've never had wilder ambitions and we've never had more primitive skill sets. I think that's so true, isn't it? Terry is dedicated to working with the general population to help women reclaim their voices and men to open their hearts. The Institute offers a training program for therapists as well as workshops and trainings throughout the US and Canada. 
Tonight, Terry's going to speak about his newest book, his, his newest body of work called Us, Moving Beyond Me and You. And we're delighted to have you, Terry. I'll, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Robin. I really appreciate it. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for spending time with me. And thank you for your interest. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Terry Real, as you know, and I guess some of you have been spending some time uh, with some of my material. So some of you may know a bit of what I'm about to say, but um, I, I like to say we therapists are in the business of saying what goes without saying. So uh, I'm going to say it anyway. <clears throat> Here's the big picture. We are all of us trying to be intimate with one another silhouetted against the backdrop of a culture that is not intimate. We do not live in a relationship cherishing culture. We live in a patriarchal, in, toxically individualistic. I mean, in my country, uh, you look at people who feel like they have the right to inflict their disease on someone else in the spirit of being a free individual. It's really gone uh, quite overboard. And my new book, Us, that I'm working on, I'm writing it as we speak, it will be published a year from this spring, uh, is about the myth of individualism and what individualism has done to uh, really uh, co-opt our relationships, both with our own selves and with one another. So all of this is playing out against the backdrop of individualism and patriarchy. And there are some immediate consequences to that. Here's the first one. As Robin was saying, marriage is not doing that well. Uh, 43 plus percent of marriages end in divorce. And of those long-term relationships and marriages that stay, how many of them are really happy? versus staying together for money or the kids or religion or whatever. Well, what this means is that if you do what you've been taught to do in this culture, if you simply uh, do what you need to do uh, to have a close relationship based on your natural instincts, your spontaneity in this particular culture, you're gonna be screwed. That's not gonna work very well. And I talk to people about learning to become artful. Uh, sometimes when, as a couples therapist, you tell somebody to practice a new skill, um, standing up for yourself with love, for example, that's a new skill. Uh, they'll say to you, oh, this feels so artificial. I, I want to be, uh, I, I want to be spontaneous, at which point I say, well, you've been spontaneous. How has that been working for you? I don't want you to be artificial, but I do want you to be artful. We have never wanted more from our relationships than we do in this particular historic moment. Uh, we want long walks on the beach. We want holding hands. And we want good sex in our 50s, 60s, and beyond. We really want to be lifelong lovers. And uh, unfortunately, as Robin said, our ambitions are historically sky high. We've never wanted so much out of marriage and long-term relationships. In my parents' age and the age before them, if you were good companions, that was good enough. But we want more. We want real emotional intimacy, and we don't have the skills to pull it off. There's a relational technology that I've created and others have created that can be cultivated and learned and mastered. And it works better than what you learned in that school of relationships called your family or what you learned from the culture at large. So this is about going beyond your defaults. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had that experience where you feel like a passenger in your own transaction, you're watching yourself, you've said to yourself, this time I will not yell at my kids, this time I will not distance from my partner, this time I will not shut down and clam up, and yet you do. Quicker than you can blink, you're back in the same old, same old, you're watching the disaster while it's happening, and you can't seem to stop it. Have you ever had that experience? Well, I certainly know I have. 
what is going on? What, what, what this points to is what I teach my students is the most important question a couples therapist can have. What do you think it is? The most important question is not what are the external stressors that you and your partner are dealing with? A good couple can handle stress. The, the most important question is not even what's the choreography between them? What's the dance, the vicious cycle, pursuer, distancer, uh, abuser, victim? W what is the thing that keeps repeating over and over and over again? That's really important, but it's not the most important question. The most important question I think of when I do couples therapy is this, ready? Which part of you am I speaking to? Which part of you am I speaking to? I talk about us consciousness, the wise adult part of us, and I talk about me and you consciousness, the part of us that I'll explain in a bit, the part of us that adapted to what was going on. And these two parts of us are literally different circuits in our neurology, in our brain. The wise adult part of us is present-based, is here and now, It's not been co-opted by trauma. You are not triggered. You are right here in your centered adult self with me in contact. That's what I call the wise adult part of us. It, for the, those of you who are into the brain, it's the most mature part of the brain, the one that develops last, the prefrontal cortex. Uh, the other part of us, which the trauma field has been very uh, busy with, is the wounded child part of us, very young, wounded, hurt. That's the part of us that was just on the receiving end of the abandonment or the abuse and feels overwhelmed. When I do imaginative work with a wounded child part of one of my clients or with my own self, it's usually personified as the first moments of life up to four or five years old. And the wounded child part of us just wants to crawl up into somebody's lap and be held for about a thousand years, maybe cry for about 500 of them. Just the part of you that's overwhelmed with whatever happened to you, very young. Between the wise adult prefrontal cortex and the very, very young wounded child is what I call the adapted child, the adapted child part of us. The adaptive child part of us is that part of you that adapted to whatever was going on in your environment, that reacted to it, that resisted it, and that also took it in and internalized it. It's a combination of both. So what do I mean? The adaptive child, which is a concept I inherited from one of my mentors, a beautiful woman named Pia Melody, P-I-A-M-E-L-L-O-D-Y. She says the adaptive child part of us is a kid in grown-ups clothing. It's an immature version of what a mature person looks like. It's what you cobble together in the face of trauma or in the face of neglect. In the absence of healthy parenting, you put together a version of an adult based on what the kids are doing in the playground, based on teachers, based on magazines and movies and what you see in the culture and what you make up in your own head. The adaptive child part of us is different from the wise adult part of us. It's a different part of the brain that's not the mature prefrontal cortex, it's the triggered limbic system in amygdala, subcortical, we call it. It's a more primitive part of the brain. It's very fast, it's very visceral. I talk about whoosh, W-H-O-O-S-H, whoosh, the wave that comes up from the feet. It's your first consciousness, your knee-jerk response. And I'll tell you, in 30 years, I've never met a whoosh yet that doesn't fall under the category of fight, flight, or fix. Take a moment. What do I mean by fight? Everybody knows what fight. Screw me, screw you. It's symmetrical. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, flight is interesting. You can flee and still be standing six inches in front of the person. That's called stonewalling somebody. You can be passive aggressive and flee. But the essence of fleeing is get me out of here. I want no part of it. 
And fix is an interesting one. Therapists specialize in fix, as do codependent women. Fix means, oh my God, there's some tension here. I better take it away in order for me to be peaceful. It's not a mature, I want to work on this relationship to see if I can make it better. It's a compelled, anxious, I've got to get the thing to be peaceful or I'm going to die. Fight, flight, fix. Those of you who are listening to me, take a moment and out yourself. I know that 364 days out of the year, you're in your wise adult and you're centered. But that one day out of the year when you're in your adaptive child, where would you tend to go? Fight, flight, or fix? This is a first exercise of many, many exercises that we have that are about getting you to get familiar with, shake hands with the adaptive child part of you. Most of the people that come see me have lived most of their lives in their adaptive child, thinking it's a functional adult and often being rewarded by our patriarchal culture. But it's not the most mature part of you. It's not the part of you that can truly be intimate. You cannot be intimate from one down shame. You cannot be intimate from one up superiority and grandiosity, both attributes of the adaptive child. You have to be what we call same as, neither better nor worse than the person you're speaking to. I was really heartened yesterday. I heard President Biden say, if you work for me and I over, this is a speech that he gave. If you work for me and I overhear you speaking or behaving to anyone disrespectfully, you're fired on the spot. That's my kind of a guy. I talk to you and I will invite everybody listening to come down from the one up of superiority, come up from the one down of shame and inferiority and join whoever you're with eyeball to eyeball in intimacy, same as neither better nor worse than the person that you're speaking to. You cannot love from the one up superior. You cannot love from the one down inferior. Love demands equality. Love demands democracy. So, us consciousness is what the wise adult can hold. What does that mean? That means that you have a sense of the whole, that you have a sense of the relationship. You don't make sacrifices to your partner. It's not a win-lose game. You make sacrifices to the relationship because it's good for you to do so. You make sacrifices for the relationship because it's good for you to do so. This is ecological thinking. This is what I call us consciousness. It's running your relationship from an ecological point of view. And it corrects for the distortions of patriarchy and individualism. The essence of individualism is we are apart from nature. And the essence of patriarchy is we are above nature, dominating it. This is the essential delusion of the culture that we both live in. We are not apart from the system that we're in, and we're certainly not above it. Our relationships are like our biosphere. It is the air that we breathe. We're not above our own marriages. We're in our marriages. We're not, we're not masters of the family that we create. We are a member of the family that we create. Sure, you can pollute your biosphere by releasing a bunch of toxins in your anger and upset over here, but you're gonna be breathing that toxin in your partner's distance or resentment over here. You and they are linked. You are not above it and unmoved by it. From the relational perspective, if one of you wins and the other one loses, you both lose. Why? Not some pie in the sky idealism, you lose because the so-called loser will make the so-called winner pay for it. Count on it. If one of you wins and the other one loses, you both lose because there'll be trouble on the line. It is in your interest 
to take care of your partner. It's in your interest to take care of the relationship. This is us consciousness, an enlightened kind of holding of the whole, holding of the humility of understanding I'm not above it, I'm in it. You and me consciousness, by contrast, the adaptive child part of us, subcortical part of the brain has no sense of the whole, no sense of relationship. In, in the adaptive child world, the me and you world is me versus you. It's a win-lose, zero-sum game. Uh, if you get it, then you've taken it off my plate. This is delusional. We do not live in a zero-sum world. We live in an ecological system that is interdependent with one another. The relational answer to the question, for example, who's right and who's wrong is who cares? It doesn't matter. What matters is how are we as a team going to work through this issue in a way that works for both of us? I had a couple in here just uh, a little while ago on Zoom, but you know, I was talking to them here. And uh, it was a classic situation, very straightforward gender wise. He drove quote unquote, recklessly in her terms, quote unquote, assertively in his terms. He would tailgate people while they drove and she would get nervous. At first she would be, you're a bad driver. This is terrible, blah, 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 blah. And he would be, no, I'm not, I'm good. I'm blah, 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 blah. This is what I call objectivity battles. You're a bad driver, you're a good driver. You're a bad driver, you're a good driver. You're arguing over the objective reality. Here's my first relational bitter pill for you all tonight. There is no place for objective reality in personal relationships. You don't need it. It just gets people in the way. Forget about what did or didn't happen. That's our first reference when we think individualistically. The second reference when we think individualistically is ourselves. I can't believe I have to put up with this crap again. Instead, think of two subjective people with their own experience who are connected to one another in love. Is he a bad driver? Is she overly worried? I don't care. I'll tell you why. Here's the bottom line. Every time she gets in his car, she has heart palpitations and she drives herself crazy. Here's what I taught her to say. Whether you're a bad driver or not, I want you to know that the way you drive scares me to death. As a favor to me, dear husband, would you please slow down and leave more room between you and someone else so that I don't have to be so frightened? And keeping to a role I prescribed to many men, a generous gentleman, thinking like a generous gentleman, he took a breath let go of his right to drive any way he wanted. That's individualistic thinking. And instead offered something conciliatory and compassionate to the woman he loved. Why would he do this? Because he loves her. That's A, he doesn't want her to feel bad. Hello, wake up. Remember, you're in a relationship. And why else would he do it? Because it's in his interest to do it. Happy wife, happy life. If you are happy in my relationship with you, I am happy being with you. It is enlightened self-interest. I don't talk to people about altruism. I talk about enlightened self-interest. So let me talk about two concrete things that I'd like to get across before we leave tonight. The first is standing up for yourself with love which is critical for both, but I think it's particularly important for women these days. Standing up for yourself with love. Under patriarchy, you can be connected or you can be powerful, but you can't be both at the same time. Let me say that again. In patriarchy, you can be connected or you can be powerful, but you can't be both at the same time because power means dominance. Power means power over not as Rianne Eisler says, power with. And so power over breaks the connection. And a lot of times 
when people who've been disempowered find their voice, they scoot from the traditional feminine side to the traditional masculine side, and they speak in ways that are righteous and correct, but non-relational, and they don't get heard. I want to teach people how to cherish their partner and stand up for themselves in the same breath. This is brand new territory. I love you. I want to be close to you. Could you please do this more and that less so that that can happen? It's the difference between saying to somebody, I don't like the way you're talking to me and saying to somebody, you know, I want to hear what you have to say, sweetheart. Could you drop the tone so I can really listen? Two ways of saying the same thing. But one is righteous and individualistic. The other is cherishing and relational. Even while you're powerful. People think that you have to trade connection and love in order to be powerful. That's patriarchy. We can move beyond that, both men and women. How to be cherishing and loving in the same breath breaks the back of patriarchy and brings us to new territory altogether. The corollary to that is how to listen and how to respond, how to be, if you're a guy, a generous gentleman or a generous gentlewoman. What does this mean? It means that you put objective reality aside. You put your version of what happened aside and you try and enter in to the subjective experience of your partner without getting defensive and with compassion. Am I driving badly? Are you saying I'm driving? We don't care. You're scared. I love you. I'm sorry. Let's see what we can do to help you be less scared. I don't want to drive around with you being miserable and scared all night. Let's work this out together. I will make that sacrifice, not for you, but for our relationship. Not for you, but for me, for my own enlightened self-interest. So when you speak, cherish the person you're speaking to at the same time that you're being assertive. And when you listen, put your ego aside, put reality aside, stop bitching about what a pain in the ass it is that you're being dealt with this. Don't worry about you. Don't worry about reality. Worry about your hurt, upset partner. When you are faced with an upset partner, it is not a dialogue. Everybody gets this wrong. It is not a conversation. It is not you tell me what's wrong with me and then I tell you what's wrong. No. When you're faced with an upset partner, the job is repair. You want to bring that partner back into harmony with you when they're in a state of disrepair so that you can enjoy each other. You know, when Belinda and I fight now on a good day, not a bad one, on a bad one, we look just like you, but on a good day, after maybe 15, 20 minutes, one of our others will come back and say something like this, honey. I don't want to fight. You want to fight? I don't really want to fight. I'd rather watch TV with you tonight than fight. Look, what do you need? Well, Terry, you could say that you're blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Honey, what do you need? Well, Belinda, you know, you really were kind of, okay, I acknowledge that. Great. What's, what's, what's for TV? <laughs> what do you want to do for the rest of the night? And the reason why we give up being right and righteous and clearing the air and driving our partner down the ground uh, with our whatever is a very simple. You want to know what it is? What I'm thinking about is what kind of evening do I want to have with my wife? I can have an evening of fighting or I can have an evening of snuggling. I'll take the latter. And that's my responsibility as an adult partner. So I want you to reach beyond your first consciousness. Reach beyond your knee-jerk response. Take a breath, count to 10, and reach for that more mature part of you. Get re-centered. I call this relational mindfulness. And it's an intentional practice, just like meditation or another form of mindfulness. You notice when you're triggered. You notice when you're in me and you consciousness. You take a breath. You take a walk around the block. You take a break from your partner and you get re-centered. I call this remembering love. You remember that the person you're speaking to is someone you care about. And the reason why you're speaking is to make things better. That's good for them. That's good for you. That's good for the kids in the house. It's good for your bodies. It's good for your health. 
learn some basic intimacy skills and you will live longer, you'll live happier, and the whole family will rise in their level of growth and maturity and freedom. That's, that's beautiful, Terry. I, so many nuggets of wisdom in there. I mean, I think there was at least 10 quotes that we're going to have to requote for, <laughs> in the next week. Uh, the, the first question that we're going to go into our Q&A, and if for those of you that are live with us on this keynote, please put your questions in the chat, and I'm going to do my best to include them um, for Terry to answer. So he's welcoming any questions that come through. The first question actually relates to exactly what you were just talking about. It's from Cindy in Edmonton. She's asking, what are ways for a man who comes from a patriarchal system to create more intimacy between himself and his wife? Yeah, boy, I'm sure she's not the only woman with that question. Let me tell you, across the board, in heterosexual relationships, women are asking for more emotional intimacy from men than we traditionally raise boys and men to have under patriarchy. But what I say to Harry is, Harry, Harry has been dragged in to see me. Harry, you're a statistic, man. There are hundreds and thousands of Harrys all over North America being dragged into offices just like mine so that I can make you more relational and less insufferable to be with. This is not about your mother, Harry. This is a social thing that's going on. What you learned as a boy to be independent, to be tough, to be stoic, to not express feelings, to never ever be vulnerable. What you learned as a boy about what it takes to be a man by today's standards will guarantee you'll be seen as a lousy husband. Women want men's hearts. Women want men to open up, share their feelings, be able to identify their feelings. There are seven primary feelings, joy, pain, anger, fear, shame, guilt, love. Joy, pain, you can write these down and people can look at them. Joy, pain, anger, fear, shame, guilt, love. I have a list. I hand it to a guy like Harry. I say, what are you feeling right there in that, as you're sitting there on that couch? This is a guy who says he has no feeling. Uh, uh, I guess I'm feeling nervous. Uh, okay, what are you nervous about? Uh, uh, I think I'm gonna fail this, this exercise. All right, good. Where's that nervousness in your body? Uh, kind of butterflies in my chest. If those butterflies could speak, what would they be saying? Uh, I hope I don't screw up. Great, Harry. What else are you feeling? Look at the list. Well, I, I guess I'm feeling some, some relief that we're talking about this stuff. That's joy, Harry. Where do you feel? And on, here's the punchline. By the time I'm done, Harry, who swears he's never had a feeling in his life, has just articulated four, five, six feelings. And I get to say to him, Harry, you're a very passionate man. It isn't that your feelings left you, it's that you left them. All you have to do is turn the satellite dish in and start paying attention. And they're all there waiting for you. And I do believe this. Men are just as emotional as women are. We're taught to stifle it. We're taught to not pay attention to it. But men are just as tender just as vulnerable, just as needing of dependency and warmth and love as women are. It's just that we're socialized to not acknowledge it. So what is a man to do? Open up. Identify your feelings. Identify your wants. And dare to move into vulnerability. Dare to be weak. Dare to not have your shit together. Dare to ask for help or comfort. You're missing out. You're an empty fortress. Open up the drawbridge and let someone in. And if you can't do it on your own, get some help from someone like me. Absolutely. The next question actually just came in through the chat. What do you do when your partner is not interested in affection at all? But in this case, it's a, it's a husband and wife. And the wife craves it, asks for it, talks about it directly, but her partner doesn't feel the need for such connection. 
Yeah. Here's the first thing I would say if I had this couple in my office and uh, the guy said, well, I just don't feel the need for much physical affection or physical connection. Uh, my immediate response would be, well, that's great. That's one of you. You want to hear the rest of it? If you lived in a cave, you'd be fine. If you were married to you, you'd be a piece of cake. But you foolishly got this woman into your life. And now there are two of you. You can live without physical affection, but she can't. And I dare say most women wouldn't. And I dare say most of the women you would be interested in wouldn't put up with it. So look, man, it's not that hard. Let me help you get out of your comfort zone and meet some of these new demands. You know, my pal Esther Perel once wrote that the great story of the 20th century may be the change in women's roles. And the great story of the 21st century may be how men react to the change of women's roles. A lot of therapists and a lot of uh, sort of cultural movement right now is reacting to women's new empowerment by backing them off. If we could all just go back to the 50s, all would be well. I don't want women to stand down. The demand for more intimacy is legit. I want men to be empowered to stand up and meet these new demands. Intimacy is a good thing. Research is really clear. Intimacy is good for our physical health, our mental health. It's good for our families. It's good for our souls. So I believe in intimacy. And when I'm dealing in a couple where one person wants more intimacy than the other, I always side with the one who wants more intimacy. Their delivery may suck. They may need to figure out how to speak up with love instead of righteousness. But what they're asking for is legit. I don't want men to get a pass. I want men to rise to the occasion and meet these new demands of intimacy. It's good for us. I've got a question from somebody who is not with a partner, but looking for someone. She's asking, how do you identify someone who is or isn't emotionally intimate as you go through the dating process? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard mm -hmm. uh, when we are in that audition phase of relationships. And I, can I tell you why it's so hard? Because we lie. <laughs> <laughs> We put our best foot forward and, you know, we act like we're the souls of intimacy when uh, if you look at the now, look, you want to broaden your contact. So you want to ask this person about previous relationships and listen to the way they talk about it. Do they take responsibility for their part in things or are they just bitterly blaming their partner? If you talk to somebody about previous relationships and relationship after relationship, they're the victim and their partner was a jerk. Uh, you know what, that's a red flag. If you talk to somebody about their previous relationships, and they're thoughtful, and they're tender, and they call it like it is, look, I wasn't happy with that person. That's why we're not with each other anymore. But I can understand that I wasn't the biggest joy to live with either. Let me tell you about it. That's a keeper. So you ask them about previous relationships, and you see how they handle themselves with it. And you, uh, you pay attention to how you're being treated. A lot of romantic, this is true primarily for women, but a lot of romantics get all caught up in what a wonderful person that person is. I don't care if they're a wonderful person. I care about, are they treating you wonderfully? You know, that, um, oh gosh, I saw a New Yorker cartoon where a woman was bringing home to her parents um, the, uh, the, what, what is it called? The, the, the Bigfoot, right? That's your neck of the woods out up in Canada, this big hairy monster. And the caption reads as she looks at her mom and dad, I know, but he'll change. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck with Bigfoot. He ain't going to change. You know, there's an old French proverb, uh, women marry men hoping they'll change. They don't. Men marry women hoping they won't change. They do. And the reason for that is that women want their men to be more relational. And what you have to do when you're dating is you have to really keep your eyes open. What were they like in other relationships? Be with their friends. Be with their family. See how they handle themselves and see how they process their relationships and talk about it with you. 
Carrie, what you we learned about this week um, through you is love without knowledge and knowledge without love, and then entering into you know the mature state no, of your no. relationship. And yeah. what um, what one of the questions that came in was how do you advise new couples or people that are still just dating to learn about each other? Like I, I know you you just mentioned these things. It's almost like she's she's asking how do we skip through as fast as possible the knowledge um, sorry love without knowledge to the knowledge or the like the stages so that you're really <laughs> getting to really to the meat of that person that relationship that you're in. Right? I don't want anybody to take <laughs> You probably don't want to skip forward, right? <laughs> I, I will tell you, Robin, if you really want to speed past the harmony phase and get into disharmony and dis No, you don't want to. No, if you do, have kids. <laughs> That's my advice. They'll throw you right into disillusionment. Uh, one of the open secrets is how kids eviscerate romance in relationships and couples. So if you're still in the harmony phase, uh, after you've had kids, you're doing really well because most people crash once that uh, stress hits the uh, hits the family. And then the rest is like, you know, peering through a corner through one of those scopes that have a curve in it, you have to go back to their previous relationships, you have to see them with friends and family, and you have to listen to the way they talk about things. And you have to listen to your gut. Mm -hmm. How are you being treated? No excuses. If you're being treated badly in this first phase, you can best believe you're going to be treated worse once the person gets comfortable. So keep your eyes open for those red flags. Another question that's coming through is what is the best way to handle a conversation that seems to be a you did this, you did that conversation? What is the best way not to defend? Well, first of all, let's talk about the attack. Instead of you did this, you did that, how about I? I felt this. I made this up. We have, uh, I use the feedback wheel, which was introduced to me by Pia and to her by Janet Hurley. There are four steps to it. This is what happened as I recollect it. This is the story I told myself about it. This is what I feel about it. And that all important part that everybody misses, this would help me feel better. This is the repair if you did it. And uh, keep it simple. I give my clients two sentences each. Terry, you said you were going to be home at seven. You showed up at 745. The kids and I were waiting dinner. The story I told myself is you can still be narcissistic at times and privilege your time over ours and keep us waiting. What I felt about that was hurt, scared, um, uh, uh, lonely, and angry. And what I'd like is for you to apologize to the kids, apologize to me, uh, and uh, get into uh, twice a week psychotherapy for the rest of your life. What do I say? I say first, what I hear you saying is, and I repeat what I've said. Then I say second, you're absolutely right. I was late and I was selfish. That is a character flaw of mine. If you're gonna own it, own it. This is what I did. It's not the first time I've done it. This is a fault line of my character. I'm working on it. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I can understand why you feel bad. Now that's a satisfying apology, not yes, but. You know, I tell people to feature themselves at the customer service window. You're at the customer service window and the customer says, my microwave doesn't work. They don't want to hear you say, well, my toaster doesn't work. <laughs> they don't want to hear your excuses for why the microwave doesn't work. They want a new microwave. When you are in one of those blaming conversations, take care of your partner, deal with their pain, their point of pain, help them feel better. And then you can talk about your side of the story. But first, tend to them. It's not a conversation. It goes in one direction. You're upset. I don't want you to be upset. Honey, what do you need? You can talk about your stuff later. But first, tend to your partner. Everybody gets that wrong, and it turns into a competition. Well, I feel bad about this. Well, I feel bad about this. Well, you did that. Well, you have to understand that. It's all nonsense. I feel bad about this. I'm sorry, honey. I don't want you to feel bad. 
tell me more about it. What could I say or do right now to help you feel better? That's what matters. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who cares? Such amazing skills. And I, it's just, you almost have to have like a little cheat sheet in your back pocket. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I really, I, I so appreciate this conversation. I know we, I, I'm just going to speak. If you go, uh, not to whatever, but if I want everybody to come to my website, just yes. terryreal.com. And I do have cheat sheets. I have laminated mm -hmm. flashcards to teach people, you know, uh, I, I want to say something to you. Okay, oh, hold on, wait a minute. Oh, oh okay, this is what I want to say. Uh, people all over the country are doing that. So, yes. So, Terry, what, what, what do you recommend when one partner really wants to seek out help from a therapist and the other partner is just saying, absolutely not, not doing it? I had a gal who told me that story and I talked about speaking up for yourself with love. I talked about soft power, loving power. And um, this is what she did. For uh, seven days, she met her husband. You see, a lot of women get into what I call, I hate how you're treating me. What can I make you for dinner? It's like, I hate how you're treating me, but I'm going to be overly accommodating and act like I don't. First, be congruent. If you're not happy, the first move to shake the system up is just act like you're unhappy. Anyway, this gal met her husband at the door for six days running. I hate how you're treating me. I hate this, 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 and this, as you well know. Next Thursday at 7 p.m., we have an appointment with this couples therapist, Terry Real. I expect you to get your butt in that chair along with me. If you don't, I'll be even more unhappy and even more hurt and angry than I am now. And I'm already pretty damn hurt and angry. I trust I make myself clear. Then she said, what would you like for dinner? 90 seconds, a minute and a half. And when he, she greeted her husband for six days in a row, on the seventh day, he was in my office. That's a true story. Don't be so disempowered. Put your foot down. There are three, let me just say this. There are three phases to getting what you want in a relationship. Again, this is particularly important for women because women carry the dissatisfaction so often. The first phase I call daring to rock the boat. I expect you in that chair at 7 p.m., no ifs, ands, or buts. Daring to rock the boat is when you grab your partner by the collar and in no uncertain terms, you say, this is important to me. You better take it seriously. That's the first phase. The second phase is when the son of a gun actually starts to listen to you. Now it's time to drop the sword and shield, drop the aggression, and help out roll up your sleeves and teach the man or woman what you want from them. Give them instructions, help them out. I call this helping him win, helping her succeed. There's no place in our individualistic culture for a phrase like helping her win. We don't think in those terms. So help your partner out is the second phase. And the third is make it worth their while. Once they start to give it to you, celebrate it. I tell women across the world, celebrate the glass 15% full. It was only 10% full last week. You would do this if it was a kid. If it was a kid who came in with a D minus grade and you talk to them and the next day they came in with a C, you wouldn't go, well, where's the A? You would go, this is great progress, keep going. Do that with your partner as well. Be as kind to your spouse as you are to your kid. Be as kind to your spouse as you are to your dogs and cats. I'd like people to treat each other as well as we treat our animals. I've got a question from um, somebody in Belgium asking, when you are a giver, it can be hard to recognize when it's worth staying in the relationship and when it's time to leave. Are there key signs that will tell you that a relationship is not giving you enough of what you want to not long for what you're not getting. Yeah, you know, that's very personal. Mm -hmm. um, whoever's writing this has heard me or, or I have a tool uh, to use when you're trying to decide whether you want to stay in, in a relationship or not. <clears throat> and I call this tool relational reckoning, doing a relational reckoning. And a relational reckoning consists of one question. It's a complicated question. 
Here it is. Am I getting enough in this relationship to make grieving what I'm not getting worth my while? Am I getting enough in this relationship to make the pain of what I'm not getting okay with me because I'm getting so much more? If the answer to that question is yes, I'm not getting this. I'm not getting mm, wild passionate sex. My partner has a sex molestation history and they're not gonna be wild and crazy. That's just the luck of the draw, that's who they are. I'm not gonna have that with this person, but oh my God, they're physical, they're gorgeous. They love me, I love them. We have the world's greatest time. Is this person my wildest, most passionate sex partner? No. If I watch a movie or I see a couple down the, down the block and they look wildly sexual, do I feel a pang in my heart that I don't have that in this marriage? I do. You're supposed to. What are you supposed to do with that pang? Feel it. Bear it. That's what grief is. But don't be a big resentful victim. Embrace what you are getting. Grieve what you're not getting and let it go and celebrate what you've got. Or if it's not enough, go back and fight, get into couples therapy. And if all else fails, if the answer is I'm not getting enough to make grieving what I'm not getting worth my while, it's not worth my while, then you're done. That's the end of the relationship. It's a very personal matter. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking, how can I stop feeling responsible for my partner's emotions? When she's having a bad day, I take on whatever she's feeling and I feel like I need to fix it. Yeah, well, this person needs an emergency kit and boundaries. <laughs> uh, I, I would have them read in the new rules of marriage about boundaries or I have an audio book that people can get off my website called Fierce Intimacy. It's six one hour lectures and one of the six hours is all about boundaries. Boundaries is where you end and the world begins. Just because your partner's having a bad day doesn't mean that you have to have a bad day along with her. It doesn't mean that you're responsible for being her caretaker. I would ask this person, who did you take care of growing up in your family? Uh, who had bad boundaries growing up in your family? And I bet the ranch, uh, this person moved right from taking care of some parent to taking care of their partner. It's their template for what a relationship looks like because that's their adaptive child. I grew up with a needy narcissistic mother, say, and I took care of her emotionally. And that's my model for what being with a woman looks like. That's why I'm so this, that, or the other thing. As a therapist, we have to unwind all of that. And you can unwind a lot of it on your own through reading and listening to people like me and doing some of the homework. One of the questions, and this may be boundaries related as well, Terry. One of the questions is, particularly in a new relationship, how do I maintain my individuality? Uh, well, my friend Carol Gilligan, who is the one who did the interview with me that uh, we're going to invite people to listen to and watch, uh, is famous for saying the following. There can be no relationship without voice. There can be no voice without relationship. It isn't that there is I versus we. It's my I, your I, and the we that is at another level, the we that's greater than the sum of its parts, the we that is our relationship. Now, I guarantee you, the person who's writing is not talking about losing his I for the grand we of the relationship. They're talking about as the first person, the one just before them, losing their eye because I over accommodate to your eye. No, we don't want that. We want you to stand up for yourself for the relationship, not for your own individual self. There is no such thing as an individual self. It's a myth. We all co-regulate one another. And so how do I keep my eye? Well, don't over accommodate, don't over give. You know you're doing that when you're resentful. Don't give and then resent it. That's your line. If you're gonna resent it, don't say yes because you really mean no. 
That is a key, isn't it? If you're overgiving and you're resentful, you you know that you. I love that's that's good. That's what overgiving means. Otherwise, yeah. it's just generosity. If I don't care, and I give it to you, well, that's just being a good doobie. That's just fun. But if I give it to you and then make you pay for it because I'm a sourpuss for the rest of the night, you're not doing anybody any favors. Mari from Colorado is asking, my partner is very secure with who he is and has done the work to be vulnerable with me. I, on the other hand, struggle with vulnerability and it mm. has created a wall in our relationship. Mm. How can I let my walls down so that we can feel truly and intimately connected? Uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful that a woman is saying that because it's, it goes against the stereotype, right? Uh, he's open and she's closed and walled off. Certainly, uh, this is not rare. I mean, when we talk about the generalities of men being closed off and women being dissatisfied, they, they're broad generalities and there's lots of variation, just like this couple here. Uh, she is walled off and she is mistrustful. She has a hard time opening up and letting down. She has trauma. It's just a question of what it is, how bad it is, how old she was, and how often it happened. If she's closed off, if she's behind a wall, it's because when her adaptive child was being formed when she was a little girl, that wall kept her safe and sane. I teach my students, always be respectful of the exquisite intelligence of that adaptive child. That wall is there for a reason. Respect the reason, and then you can begin to take it down. I'll tell you a quick story, if I may, and it'll be quick. Um, a guy came to me on the brink of divorce. He was a liar. He lied about everything. His wife said, if you ask him what kind of shoes he's wearing, he'll say they're sneakers. I mean, he just lies about everything. Well, I take him back, long story short, he had a completely domineering, controlling mother who wanted to own every inch of him. What did he do? What was his adaptation? He started lying. He started giving to mom what was mom's, but having a secret life of his own. This is true for many addicts. This is certainly true for most sex addicts, by the way. There's enmeshment with a parent and then a secret life to preserve you. Preserving yourself with a secret life and lying was just the thing you needed to do as that little boy. But I have a saying, adaptive then, maladaptive now. You're not that little boy. She's not your mother. This is a new set of tricks that you can learn. One day he came back from the grocery store. She'd given him five things and true to form, he'd come back with four. And she said, where's the uh, milk? Where's the milk? He said, on the tip of my tongue, I was about to say they were out of it. And instead, this is relational mindfulness. Instead, I took a breath. I got centered. I looked at my wife and I said, I forgot it. And she burst into tears. True story. She said, I've been waiting for this moment for 25 years. That's a moment of moving beyond that you and me consciousness back into us, beyond the trauma triggered defensive one of us wins and one of us loses into the wise part of we're both here together. How are we going to make it ourselves? And you can relax that wall and move into vulnerability. It often helps to have therapy and some support, but you can do it with practice. Wow. I can't believe how fast our hour went, Terry. It just flew by and just so much that you've given us to think about today and to and skills for us to like bring into our lives and our relationships such important skills so thank you so very much for oh, you. being a part of our summit and you are really truly are a pioneer um, as the creation creator of relational life therapy and the institute your work is all about how do we stay in love right you say that it's one thing to fall in love but it's another to stay and you're teaching us the tools and skills that we can employ in our relationships to sustain the long-term intimacy that many of us yearn for. So Terry, how do we, um, for those of us that really want to continue following your work and learning from you, what is the best way for us to do that? 
Well, I want everybody to go to terryreal.com. Just Google my name, T-E-R-R-Y-R-E-A-L, and it'll take you there. I'd like everybody to download the audio book, uh, Fierce Intimacy, which you can get there. It's uh, six hours of lectures and exercises that covers many of the things we, we touched on, but in more detail. I'll be offering a course uh, for the general public later on this winter. It's my first online course for the general public on how to stay in love. So go to my website, uh, sign up to be included in our emails and stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to have a lot more of this for you if you're interested. Fantastic. And your new book, Us, Moving Beyond Me and You, you said that's going to be coming out next year. Next spring, not this spring, spring. but a year from spring. So uh, everybody has a nice time to run up on it. It's going to be uh, one of the first books put out by Goop, uh, Gwyneth oh, wow. organization. Yeah, it's a Goop Penguin Random House collaboration. And uh, I'm happy to be one of their first authors. Excellent. Well, in tradition, um, what I've started doing is closing every keynote with a blessing. And I've used a lot of the work that I've learned well, from you this week. And so may we resolve to treat ourselves and each other better. May we speak to ourselves and each other less harshly. May we practice fierce intimacy, which is rooted in the courage to tell the truth to each other about how we really feel. May we learn how to listen non-defensively, how to speak from the heart without blame and with love. May we commit to using the heat of the moment not to control the other person, but to get centered inside ourselves. May we be disciplined in our thinking to see intimate relationships as a biosphere we have created, going beyond our defaults, being present, operating from us consciousness. And may we cherish our intimate relationships by continually using the skills we've learned so that between us, we may live in a state of connection. So thank you, Terry Real. Oh, Great thank time. you, Robin. It was a pure joy to be here with you. I could feel your energy and thanks for the good work you're doing. Keep it up. We'll see you soon. Good. Good night, everyone.